Hey, welcome everyone. We are live with another episode of Level Up Law, where every Tuesday at noon, South Carolina Legal Services levels up your legal knowledge about an area of law that we practice in. And we are delighted today to bring you an episode on how to get an IEP. I'm Susan Engel, Senior Staff Attorney and host of Level Up Law. And as always, our producer, Kenneth Elliott from our IT department is here making sure everything's running properly for us today. Thanks, Kenneth. You are viewing live our Education Law Unit Head, Elliot Tate, from our Charleston office. Hey, Elliot. Hey. He's going to be sharing some important information on how to get an IEP. But before that, we always do want to remind you that this is not legal advice. It's just general information for the public, but it is important information. So um, we're glad you're here, whether it's live or on the replay. If you need the help of a lawyer, you can call our intake line here at South Carolina Legal Services or apply online and all that information is going to be provided to you at the end of the presentation. Also, as a reminder, all of our episodes are posted by our producer, Kenneth Elliott, to the Level Up Law playlist on our YouTube channel. That gets done pretty quickly so you can uh, catch up there. Um, for today, if there are some general questions for Elliot, uh, if there's time at the conclusion of the presentation, just put those in the question box and we'll see if we can get those answered for you. So that's it. Let's get started, Elliot. How to get an IEP. Oh, did the, I didn't click through for the oh, QR. I'm so sorry, right, Susie. Uh, that's okay. I uh, missed on that too. This is a QR code on your screen, everyone, where you can scan it and send us a topic suggestion for um, a episode of Level Up Law. And uh, scan that, and we always welcome those ideas. Okay, let's get started. Okay, here we go. Sorry, apparently there's like a party happening right outside of my office door. My colleagues are just having a lovely time without me. So if you, if you hear that, I apologize that they're being loud. Um, so how to get an IEP. This is gonna be a quick one because um, it's pretty straightforward and simple, but I think it's it's really important. Um, we're about to start the school year, so um, some families with students who, who might qualify for an IEP might uh, might need this information. Uh, and if not now, then certainly in the, next, in the coming months when kids are in school and you're starting to see the struggles. So quick and easy, how to get an IEP. Um, one quick slide on what an IEP is. It stands for Individualized education program. Um, a lot of folks say plan instead of program. I say plan instead of program sometimes, but it's individualized education program. It's a written agreement between the school and family about special ed services a student's gonna receive from the school and then why those services are appropriate. Um, it's federal law, as you see over here. Um, it's got a few components to it, and we've done a number of Level Up Law episodes um, just diving into uh, the, the depths of an IEP, but just um, some, some, a few parts just as, again, background. There's some background info on the kid and the family. You take a kind of a snapshot of the present levels of, of where that kid is. Um, you set some goals for that kid. Um, you give a statement of the services. So the amount of minutes that they're going to be receiving and and where and what type of services and then certain accommodations so that's basically what an iep is so how do you get it step one you request an evaluation in writing um, you send it to some some way that you can track it so i mean fax and email even fax seems kind of antiquated but it's actually great because you get a fax confirmation um, so you know they received it. You can't really always do that reliably with email, but you know email is is reliable as well. And certified mail is also available. Um, I recommend people do it multiple ways to multiple people, just because of how important this step is, and because of how kind of squirrely sometimes the school can be about um, when they receive notice or, or a request, because it starts a timeline. That's very firm for them. Um, so send it to multiple people. So you send it to whatever teacher your, your kid has. Don't stop there. Send it to the principal. Or if you know, that if there's like someone in the administration, like a vice principal who handles special ed in the school, send it to them. Get on the website, locate like the director of special ed. It's, they're called different things. 
Um, they're called like you know, special services. Um, what are they called? Like something or other children. Anyway, it's uh, so go on the on the school district's website and find someone at the school district level um, in that main district office that you can also send this to. And it's important to give your consent to the evaluation in that letter. So federal law sets sets forth the 60-day um, deadline for the school to complete an evaluation. And that's from the date that they receive consent to complete that evaluation. So what we rec recommend is when you request that evaluation, you also put clear language in there that says that we consent to an evaluation. So when they receive that consent, that's when that 60-day calendar starts. And those are 60 calendar days, not 60 school days. Um, so typically, the school's going to hold a meeting. They're going to hold what's called an, an evaluation planning meeting. It's called different things in different school districts. But they're going to essentially discuss all of the suspected areas of need and set the roadmap for the eval. They're going to ask you for whatever medical docs you've got. Um, it's kind of like it's sort of an informal um, give and take question and answer about just like what everyone's seeing from this kid. Um, sometimes the teachers are saying, yep, yeah, we're seeing this, we're seeing that. A lot of times the teachers are quiet and it's just, uh, just mom and dad or, or one of, one of y'all talking about, um, what you think's happening with your kid. And you don't have to have, you know, a firm grasp on, on, on the areas of, of need. You know, they're, they're supposed to, um, evaluate any suspected area of need. And if you're not really sure, you just see that your kid's struggling. Um, then, then the district needs to be helping guide you through what potential areas of need could be evaluated. And they should be leaning on the side of, well, if we think this might be a question, let's evaluate. Because we can at, at least um, say, well, you know, speech is not a need that, that this kid needs, or physical therapy is not something that this kid needs. But um, it's, it's best to evaluate and rule it out that way. After that, um, you will wait and participate. Um, a little rhyme I coined in the development of this presentation. Um, so you get 60 days and you know you don't need to just tw twiddle your thumbs for those 60 days. You can gather relevant medical records and documents that you've got. Um, you might have a bunch depending on how complicated your, your kids um, disability or disabilities are. Um, you might not have much. So it might just be a basic note um, regarding ADHD from the pediatrician. Um, that's helpful though. Uh, you, you might have a formal diagnosis um, from your pediatrician or from a therapist. Um, that's extremely useful. Um, if your kid's got like behavioral issues, attention issues, then the school's going to send you what's called a rating scale. And now they're typically all web-based where they send you a link. You click that link, it goes to like, you know, filling in the bubble basically, like the SATs, where you're filling in the bubbles about how your kid's disability is potentially impacting them. So like their behavior at home, their behavior at school, all this stuff. So you want to complete those. And just remain in contact with the school psychologist, the evaluator. So. These, uh, this evaluation is done by a school psychologist. They're a master's, typically a master's level at least, um, school psychologist who does the evaluation. And that they're trained to do evaluations for this, this whole process. Step two is to determine eligibility. So after the evaluation is complete, the IEP team is going to gather to review two questions. First question is, this is this a kid with a disability as defined by the statute the statute is the idea um, and there's a whole list of disabilities so you got to figure out is is there data is, is there documentation to support that this kid has one of these disabilities um, i have bolded just a couple of important ones so autism you'll see and i'll kind of do this here other health impairment that's kind of a catch-all for things like ADHD, ADD, um, ODD sometimes kind of fits under there too. Um, 
And then specific learning disability, that's a, that's a very specific um, diagnosis with, with its own kind of criteria. Um, so you've got to find one way to uh, qualify your kid under one of these labels. And they're kind of, they're headings, they're kind of groups. Um, and that's what, certainly what something a, a lawyer can help you with. Um, the second question is oftentimes the, the more difficult question. And it's this, does that disability impact the student's learning such that they need specialized instruction? All right, let's kind of pause and, and digest that a little bit. So you get two steps for eligibility for an IEP. One is you've got to prove a disability. And that, that can be pretty um, straightforward. It's not easy necessarily, but it can be pretty straightforward. Step two, or the, the second part of step two, step 2b is more complicated so connecting that disability to the need for specialized instruction so what is specialized instruction and a lot of times so i was recently at, a, at an iap meeting where we were having this discussion that the child had um, adhd and it was having some impact in the classroom but we weren't sure that he needed specialized instruction and and one of the questions that i threw out to the special ed teacher and teachers really was okay like what would you be teaching this kid in the classroom in your special ed classroom so imagine like kind of pulling this kid out you know all, you don't always pull them out but imagine kind of pulling them out or having a, a special ed teacher go into the classroom and have them teach something specialized um, that the other kids wouldn't be getting um, so does that disability require that extra step? So the disability impacts learning such that you need to, to give them this specialized instruction from a special ed teacher. Um, and in that case, we determined at this point, probably not, we could get away with accommodations in a 504 plan, that an IEP was therefore not necessary because there wasn't clear evidence that the disability impacted his learning such that he needed specialized instruction. We we're going to try and give him some strong accommodations and see. Um, and you know, we we were going to reconvene, you know, three or six months into the school year to um, to see if maybe specialized instruction would be useful. Um, so that's that's like the crux, really, of this analysis. Um, I wrote a second question here. What if they only need related services? And these are kind of like terms of art here: specialized instruction, related services. They're kind of terms of art. So a related service is something like speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, um, counseling. So if that if that's all that they require because of their disability, then they do not qualify for an IEP. So you can get that related service in a 504 plan. So you can get occupational therapy um, because you've got maybe a disability that impacts your fine motor skills. Um, or you've got maybe an emotional issue that requires a therapy. You can do that in a related as a related service in a 504 plan. So that is not going to qualify you for an IEP. In step three, if you um, if you have a, a disability that does impact students' learning and, and that impact does require specialized instruction, then you develop the individualized education program. You get the IEP. You get the team together, and here's the, the members of the team. You get the parent, regular ed teacher, special ed teacher, someone in admin who can represent the school, um, someone who can interpret the data, um, and then, if appropriate, that student's going to be there. You're going to set goals. Um, where do you think this kid should be in six months or a year, um, given that they're going to be getting this specialized instruction? And then you want to monitor the progress. You should be getting regular progress reports on how your students are progressing toward their goals. And that, my friends, is it. So that's how you get an IEP. Susie? That's awesome. It seems so simple, but uh, as you said and um, highlighted, there's a lot uh, that's going on behind the scenes and things that uh, we need to do to make that uh, IEP happen. So great information, Elliot. Thank you so much. Um, really do 
appreciate that. Um, as always, uh, we'll post an episode. We'll post this episode on our YouTube channel, and I want to invite everyone to look at our connect card here um, for a few things. One is the couple of ways that you can apply for our services if you're having difficulty with um, that IEP process. We have attorneys who can help out with that. You can apply for our services by telephone or online, and we uh, welcome you to do that. Um, you can also scan that QR code and sign up for our newsletter. And there's um, you know, great information that will uh, come out of that, and you can sign up to get uh, those regular emails. And then also, we're on all the social media. There's great resources that we put out there in addition to um, videos uh, uh, like Level Up Law and others that we put on our YouTube channel, but we're also always putting out good resources and information on all the other um, types of social media here. And we're even on TikTok now. So um, check us out there and be sure to um, like, subscribe, follow, and all those wonderful things that happen on social media. And if you uh, found today's episode helpful, and I'm sure you did, uh, please do share it out with uh, other folks that you know who may have uh, need of that information. And also, you know, look on our YouTube uh, playlist. Our Level Up Law playlist has some of Elliot's previous uh, episodes where he's done some deep dives into these type of subjects, and those can be really informative as well. So, Elliot, thank you for all the hard work you do with our Education Law Unit and for um, sharing your expertise here on Level Up Law. We appreciate your willingness to do that. Sure, there's lots of lots of really boring content that I put up there. So have at it, y'all. <laughs> yeah, you are one of our uh, most excellent speakers. Um, so uh, once you've uh, done the QR code here and you've checked out our social media and made sure that you're following us, um, we want you to, you know, like I said, share that information with people that you know. Um, they may not need it, but they might know somebody who does. And then, uh, as always, tune in next week on Tuesday at noon for another episode of Level Up Law, where we'll be talking about Medicaid. The title is, I received documents from Medicaid. What do I do now? That's going to be really helpful. A lot of stuff going on with Medicaid these days. Well, Elliot, thanks so much to you uh, for your presentation today. Uh, Producer Kenneth Elliott there in the background, thanks for all your help. And thanks to you, our audience. We appreciate you tuning in today on Level Up Law, whether it's live or on the replay. Thanks for joining us. And that concludes today's webinar. Thanks again, Elliot. Take care, everyone. <laughs>